Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. And so you have to make sure that everything works together. They have enough food and water and supplies and everything to get to the top of the mountain. And a lot of times we just simply don't do that. It's just a lot of assumptions, a lot of focus on us and what we do, and very little focus on the client and the client's needs. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we're speaking with Pam Hurley, who is the founder of Hurley Wright Inc., where she has developed a curriculum that hundreds of companies use to improve their team's writing, reviewing, and presentation skills. From personal experience, I can tell you that technical writing is an area many engineers struggle with, and if you're one of those engineers, it is holding you back from opportunities that would otherwise be available to you. So let's get into it. Pam, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Tell me, how did you first see the need in the technical world for better writing skills? Oh, that's a great question. I was teaching in academia, and I realized that a lot of the writing courses that were available um, were just not preparing students to, to, to write in the real world. I developed a technical writing class, um, a foundational and then a, an advanced class where they had to use uh, writing in real world applications. So had them do feasibility studies and things like that. Because the sad reality is, is that most universities do a pretty poor job of teaching folks, especially engineers, how to write in the real world. And so my goal was to um, help them on that journey to understand that they would have to write. Uh, a lot of engineers like, oh, I'm, we hear that from clients. Oh, I just wanted to be an engineer. I didn't want to write. And not understanding that in most professions, um, you have to write and you have to write well, to your point. If you don't write well, you are being held back. Uh, a very experienced engineer I worked with towards the beginning of my career once told me the output of engineering is documentation. And documentation is is so critical, right? Um, not all engineers love doing documentation, but it's part of the job, right? It comes with the territory. And uh, I, I said it in the beginning of this episode, if you're not good at technical writing, you're missing out on opportunities that would otherwise be available to you. I mean, that's exactly right. One of the things we talked about in our classes, one of the first things I say when I teach, and hopefully my instructors do as well, is the document is the deliverable. It doesn't matter if you do great work behind the scenes, if you can't convey the results or one of the things we see a lot with engineers um, specifically is that they tend to be incredibly verbose, including unnecessary details. So if it's really difficult for your readers to read and get through the information, it doesn't, you're, the work that you do behind the scenes just doesn't matter because the document is the deliverable. Yeah. I've alluded to this already, but based on the plethora of experience that you have had, what are engineers missing out on by not having great writing skills? Oh, my goodness. The list goes on and on and on. Promotions. We work with a major aerospace company, uh, and their engineers to get to the position of fellow have to write personal essays, essays about why they should be promoted and things like that. And so they hired us to help those folks write those essays because the essays were so poor that literally one of the directors was spending days rewriting uh, these essays for his engineers so that they can be promoted to these uh, pretty prestigious levels. So they're missing out on opportunities in terms of business. They're missing out on promotions. You know, they're missing out on just, you know, one of the things about writing is people kind of tend to see it in a vacuum is that well, writing is this one activity that we do that has no bearing on anything else that we do, which is totally incorrect. So the opportunity to build, to build relationships, to build rapport, to show yourself in a professional light, um, right. all of those things people miss out on when their writing skills are poor. Yeah, I, I tell young engineers frequently that 
there's only so far you can go in your career by being really good technically. That's important for sure. You need to have at least a certain level of expertise in your field from a technical standpoint. But there's a ceiling there if your only skills are technical. If you don't have the communication skills, the soft skills, then there's a ceiling beyond which it's hard to achieve. But if you have that minimum uh, technical skill set and you're also really good with communication and soft skills, there's almost no limit to how far you can go. Totally agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. Even, even in terms of presentations, when you're presenting information to, you know, to clients, to stakeholders, that kind of thing, they have to be clear. They have to be, have to be crisp. I mean, the interesting thing is that people's attention span, and I know you know this, I'm sure your listeners do as well, people's attention spans have gone down to just nothing. And so one of the things that engineers and all writers need to understand is, okay, if that's the case, then now how do we pivot so that we can write documents for readers or make presentations for audiences who have short attention spans? Because that's that's the that that's the reality of the thing. So you have to be in a in a in a state where you're constantly adjusting to meet your readers' needs and to meet your audience's needs. Yeah, I'm sorry, Pam. Could you repeat that? I was checking my text messages. Just... Oh, which one? I'm sorry. The whole thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My attention span. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one, Eric. That's a good one. I love that. That's awesome. Uh... That's awesome. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> Okay, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, we have some wonderful, wonderful engineers here at Pipeline, and I've noticed that despite the fact that they have terrific technical skills, some of them, not all of them, are not the best writers. And the grammar gets me, right? Like misspelled words, uh, inappropriate punctuation or lack of punctuation. So grammar is part of of writing but what's what's the difference between good writing and good grammar and which do you think is more important that's a really great question good good writing is far more important than good grammar we'll get call, calls all the time from bill oh, the grammar the grammar stinks or blah, blah 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 okay well grammar is easy to fix thinking not so easy to fix and so one of the things we talk about in our classes, we very rarely ever talk about grammar because grammar is something that can be AI can fix grammar for you. AI can't fix thinking. And so philosophers have said for uh, thousands of years that writing is thinking on paper. And so when mm. you read something and, and you're like, wow, I don't understand what this person said, people don't give you the benefit of the doubt. They think, oh, well, Pam, she's just She's a terrible writer. She's a terrible thinker. So the list, you know, it, it it really does snowball. People don't look at something and go, "Oh, well, I, I think I know what she meant to say." They are not going to be forgiving because the other part of that is people are bombarded with information. So thinking is critical. When you have to think about. So one of the things I love about engineers is they are wonderful thinkers. They're great strategists. They're great problem solvers. But when it comes to writing. All that falls to the, all, all that falls apart, and I blame it on academia. To be quite honest with you, because as I've said before, academia does a really poor job of teaching people how to write. They don't they, 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 they don't marry it to critical thinking, and it's one way and one way only. And they view it as a, you know they teach it as a linear process. First you outline, and then you do the first draft, and then maybe you do a second draft. So that's how people write. Well, what if you're not good at outlining? What if your brain doesn't work that way, right? When, when engineers solve a problem, they don't go in and go, well, okay, there's only one way to solve this problem. They look at multiple ways to solve a problem, and writing is exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. There's more than one way to solve any writing problem. I love the way you put that. I guess it's not you philosophers throughout the ages. Writing is thinking on paper. I've never heard it put like that before, but that makes a lot of sense. I love that. And I was going to ask you about, well, what about programs, tools like Grammarly? Don't they just fix everything? But as you pointed out, they just fix the grammar, not the underlying thought process, which is really the most important part of the writing. Exactly right. Yeah. Because, I mean, again, people make judgments about you based on your document, whether you like it or not. And you can have perfect grammar, right? And, and the document just be incomprehensible. In fact, most documents that we see are grammatically correct. Right with maybe a few punctuation errors and things like that, but 
you know, if I have a few misspelled words, but the content is there, I'm more likely to overlook the misspelled words. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about egregious, you know, 50,000 misspelled words, one or two misspelled words. If the content is there and the logic is there, then I'm going to be a lot more likely to overlook the grammar problems because those are, those are, that's minutia. That's minor. We can fix that stuff. I love that. Focusing on the, the core of the problem, not exactly. the superficial stuff. I once heard someone talk about the uh, writing reports within the context of engineering. And someone said, you know, reports are a waste of time. Half the time, the person writes the report and, and, and it just sits on a desk somewhere. No one even reads it. So what's, what's even the point of writing reports? And I can't remember who this was, but the response stuck with me. I thought it was very insightful. Uh, the, the gentleman who was speaking said that the, the purpose of the report, yes, is to communicate some information to someone, but arguably the most important part of that report is to help the writer really concisely understand what he or she is trying to communicate, to clarify in the writer's own mind what's happening. And, and by the end of that process of writing this report, the writer really understands this content very well. And, and that's as important, if not in some cases, more important than being able to disseminate that information to, to other people. Oh, that's, that's 100% correct. I mean, it's something about writing it down that makes it real, right? Because if you're trying to think about things in your brain all the time, one of the things we talk about in our writing courses, you know, is you have to know who you're, who you're writing for. And we actually ask students, ask participants in our classes to write those things down. Because if it's just going on in your brain, you've got a million things going on in your brain at any given time. But writing it down makes it real, and then you can work on it. And the other interesting thing, it's called incubation. I don't know what the scientific term for it is. But if you write something down, your brain is continually continuing to work on it, even if you're not physically working on it. But that doesn't happen if you haven't written it down. So it's it is it's a it's a it's a great way for for writers to understand if they understand something. And I think it was Einstein who said, "If you can't explain it simply, you simply don't understand it." It was one of those it's one of those really smart guys who said who, who said that, and it's true. Speaking of really smart guys who said things, there was a French philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who once said in a letter to an acquaintance, "I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time." Exactly. And the, the inference there being that our communication can be shorter and more succinct if we take the time to make it so. Do you find that poor written communication is more often the result of not spending enough time on it or, or a lack of the skill? I think it's not spending enough time on it. Um, planning, most writers can be spending about 80% of their time planning and only 20% of their time writing, but they don't. What, what most writers do is they... They hate it, as you suggested earlier. Most most engineers, most professionals we talk to, you'll ask, hey, how many people in this class like writing? You might get one or two people, and that is it, right? So if, if you're faced with a task that you don't enjoy, human, human beings being what they are, what do they do? They put it off, right? Regardless of what it is, whether it's writing or whatever the, um, whatever the, ca- the, the, the case may be. And then there's a struggle at the end or this hustle at the end to get it done. Well, when you do that, you're not letting, you're not giving your brain the opportunity to solve that problem, that writing problem. Who am I writing for? What am I trying to achieve? What do I want them to do? Et cetera, et cetera. You're just kind of putting words on paper and, and, and hoping for the best. The other thing I will say about this, though, is a lot of organizations, we've been in business for 35 plus years. So we work with a lot of companies. A lot of companies give lip service to good writing, how important it is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what they don't do oftentimes is, is give their writers the time and the space they need to really solve that writing problem. So it's, it's, it's on both sides, if you will, that we need to get it done. You need to produce this report, this procrastination on the part of the writer. Um, and oftentimes organizations don't, sim- simply don't give their writers the tools they need to be successful writers. I had an English teacher in high school who said something I've always remembered, and I've applied it to design. I think it's very true there as well. But what she said was, that which was easy to read was difficult to write. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you find, oh, I've heard from a few different sources that writing stimulates the brain. I mean, the act of writing stimulates creative thought. And I've certainly found that to be true in my own life. Is there a difference in terms of the de- 
the degree of creativity that gets generated between handwriting versus typing? That's a really an, an interesting question, one that I don't have the answer to. I think a lot of it just depends on the individual, him or herself, and what works for them. There's a lot of writers, for instance, who like dictation and just talking into a, a, you know, a recorder uh, yeah. stim- stimulates their their creative thoughts. So personally, I like the my my handwriting has gotten so forth that with the advent of the of the computer. I think if I hand wrote anything, no one would, I wouldn't even be able to read it. But um, <laughs> a lot of it, I think, just depends depends on the individual. But your point is a good one. I mean, the 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 point is to to write. Right. You should be writing. And research bears this out. This isn't something I just made up. But research bears out that people should be writing a minimum of 15 minutes a day, something, not an email, but uninterrupted writing. Even if you just write about the green leaves or whatever it is you want to write about, that you should be doing that. 15 minutes is nothing. Most of us waste 15 minutes a day on social media. Uh, totally. And I'm not a social media enemy or anything. I'm just saying that. The other thing that that, that research tells us is that we should be uh, reading for a minimum of 15 minutes a day and not the normal business work stuff that we read, you know, but novels and newspaper articles and magazine articles and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things that me, we may be unfamiliar with reading um, because we pick up nuances in language. We pick up style. We pick up vocabulary. I mean, you know, you're talking about 30 minutes a day, going back to your original point to enhance your um, to enhance your career uh, and enhance your communication skills. Yeah. You know, another thought that just um, came to me, a little bit tangential, but I, I want to put it out there, is that writing is gr- a great leveraged tool. If, if you're speaking to someone, there are only so many people that you can speak to, right? Because you kind of have to be in person. I mean, these days there's like teams, right? And uh, things like that. But still, you're, you're kind of one-on-one or maybe one to a few or something like that versus writing. If you can write something, that can, that can be disseminated to so many different people, especially with social media, right? Putting articles out there and things like that. A lot of people can read what you've written and it's, it's, I think a little bit more difficult to reach as many people, um, simply by speaking. I suppose there are videos out there as well, but still. You're a hundred percent right. We worked with an engineering firm. This was a couple of years ago when they were trying to write a better post on LinkedIn. And so we worked with them, helping them understand what their value prop was uh, and hoping that because their engineers were like, this does this and this does that and this does the other. And it's like, well, who cares? Nobody, right? Because what people care about, you know, when you, at the end of the day, is how documents affect them or how whatever it is you're selling affects them. They don't care yeah. how this, you know, oh, it was made in 20, you know, 2021. Who cares? Nobody. So <laughs> we really tried to... <laughs> Try to help them because people uh, do business with companies that they trust, right? And so people care about how things affect them. And that's one of the things we talk about in our classes as well. Write a document that people understand how they're going to be affected by it, right? Don't just give them a litany of, of information that, well, so what? What am I supposed to do with this information, right? So a good, a good writer. I say I use the word manipulate, and I use it in the in the best possible sense. I don't use it to, as being unethical, but a good writer manipulates the reader to take the journey with them and to get to the conclusion that the writer wants them to get to. You don't want a reader to come to a conclusion that is not the one that you wanted him or her to get to. So yeah. it's 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 very strategic, and it's it's mind blowing to me that um, strategy is it really taught along with writing. It's kind of like, well, here's, here's how to write and here's grammar and here's language. And this is, you know, but you know, the, the underlying principles of, of good communication like strategy are very rarely discussed. Yeah. Right. Well, one of the areas that uh, you work in is teaching folks how to do effective presentations. What are a, a few common mistakes that you see engineers making when making presentations? Uh, reading off the slides, slides like is number what? one. You can't read off the slides. That's bad. <laughs> well, you can, <laughs> but people don't like it very much. When I sit through what I don't know if you've seen, there's this guy on YouTube, and I can't remember his name. But it's called Avoiding Death by PowerPoint, but he's a neuroscientist. You, if, 
I'll send you the link, but it's wonderful to watch. But he's, but he talks, he says, you know, people, oh, I don't want to watch the undead. Oh, death by PowerPoint. And then they go into their office and they do exactly the same thing. Well, you did it to me. <laughs> I'm going to do it to you. So it's, it's, it's really pretty interesting. So oh. reading, slides, but I, I tell you, a bigger problem than that is that people just cram their slides full of information. I mean, they're mm. crammed full. We were with a client a couple of uh, a couple of months ago um, in sales, and their slides, and they they're, they're taking these slides and they're presenting the product, you know, sales and how you know how much the comp- what's grown, you know, blah blah blah. And they take the same information <laughs> and they present it three different ways on the same slide. I mean, I'm like, what is that? I mean, you know, a busy a busy owner or who whomever it is is in it. Well, I don't know which one of these three sh- things should I pick. They yeah, want the confusing. information. Yes, very confusing. And so that I think is is um, one of the one of the worst. It's just it's PowerPoint. It's not Power Pros, right? So, um, <laughs> and I came up with that all by myself. So. <laughs> very clever. Yeah, <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think those are those are two of the two two, two of the biggest things. I mean, people get nervous, and um, you know, a lot of times you're better off just not to have PowerPoints at all, or just have few. You know, just very few with just succinct points. But people are terrified. I think oftentimes, I mean, they're they are a security blanket, right? PowerPoint yeah. slides, but yeah, yeah, if you could just read it, that's easy. If I have to speak yeah. extemporaneously, oof, yeah, right. watch out. Exactly. That's the right. bueno. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, how about some things that um, that we should be doing during presentations that maybe not many of us are doing? Well, I think one of the things you need to do is practice. Um, a lot of folks don't, right? Because they, they do just read off the slides. And then practice without your slides. I mean, can you speak intelligently about your topic? Probably you can. But oftentimes the slides are actually a hindrance. Um, because you're relying on them instead of thinking about the natural flow of the topic and how the how topic how the topic leads from one subject to another. Um, whereas if you if you were talking if you and I were talking, um, it would probably be a totally different presentation than having the slides there that are this constant reminder. We don't even use slides when we teach classes because I find them to be a, tr- a tremendous hindrance. I mean, if I can't talk about it make make my point without slides then 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 what is the point so practicing a, a, is one thing and being aware of alternate ways to present the information um understanding who your audience is that is tantamount and i don't mean to say oh well, i'm speaking to people at such and such a conference well what do you know about these people i mean right what are some things that you would want to know about them maybe you want to know that their attention spans are short, okay? Maybe you want to know that they're experts or non-experts or whatever the case may be. Uh, and a lot of folks, a lot of writers and presenters never take the time to do that. They just make assumptions. And I'm not saying you, you always know who you're speaking to intimately, but if I have a certain position, if I'm a CEO, for instance, there are certain assumptions I can make about you, right? And then how do I then cater my presentation to that? And then just general speaking, you know, speaking skills, rushing, um, not taking breaths, not using reflective pausing. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are standing still like a stone or like a statue, um, you know, and just not being engaging are some of the mistakes that a lot of presenters make, not just engineers, a lot of presenters. Wonderful. Those are super actionable tips. Thank you for sharing all of that. No problem. Um, we're going to get right back to the questions in uh, during a short break here. Uh, Pipeline Design and Engineering is the sponsor of the Being an Engineer podcast. And at Pipeline, we develop new processes, process development, R&D. It could be a test, new test process or a new inspection process or a manufacturing process. And then we build custom equipment and automation around those processes. So if you are in need of having a new process developed and then having custom equipment, fixtures, automation built around that process, please reach out to us at Pipeline. You can contact us at teampipeline.us is our website or send us an email at info at teampipeline.us. All right, back to the reason that we're actually here today, Pam Hurley. Pam, outside of presentations, for example, like technical reports or, or even emails, what are some tips that you can share about improving our writing out, outside of the presentations? Take the time to plan. 
Eighty mm, percent, you said, 80%, right? Eighty percent. Eighty percent. Should you? We should be planning. There's all kinds of things that are involved in that, but people just tend to rush to to write instead of taking the time to really think about who are you writing for, what do you want them to do, right? What's the outcome? I always go back to. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the author John Irving. He wrote a prayer for Earl and Meany and The World yeah. According to Garp. But he, when he writes a novel, he starts with the last sentence. And that's his starting point. But we don't do that. We start from the beginning and feel like yes. we have to work our way to the end. Fascinating. So one of the things that all writers can do better is to start from the end and reverse engineer the document. If I know where I'm going it's going to be easy for me to get there. If I'm going to go see the big ball of yarn in Kansas, I'm not going to just get in the car and start driving around and hope I get there. But that's what we do with writing. We start writing. We hope, we, we hope that we get there. We oftentimes don't even know what we're trying to accomplish. But if I know what I'm trying to accomplish, then that necessarily would limit the kind and the amount of information like that, that I can include. So we always encourage our writers to start with the, start, start with the end. And, and reverse engineer. That's terrific. I'm, uh, we started a program called CAD Club at Pipeline where we open our Sounds doors. Exciting. It actually is super <laughs> cool, Pam. Thank you very much. You would be blown away I'm if sure. you attended CAD Club. <laughs> 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 no, we, we open our doors once a week to kids in the community and teach them CAD and engineering skills. Love it. Really, the purpose is to help these kids see what healthy adult behavior looks like. Now, some people argue my behavior is neither healthy or successful but <laughs> nevertheless we have other people here to demonstrate that that behavior and uh, anyway I, I bring this up because i am putting together um the, a new set of curriculum for the next term of cad club and as i was writing down some things i thought you know i don't feel like i have really great direction here so i kind of stopped and took a, a a step back and looked high level and said at the end of this class, what do I want these kids to walk away with? And I wrote down, well, I want, I want them to know this, and I want them to know this, and I want them to know that. So that was my last sentence, basically, right, effectively. These are the things I want the kids to, to walk away with at the end. And once I had the end in mind, then it was a lot easier to go back and say, okay, what does week one look like? What does week two look like? So anyway, I, I really appreciate what you were just saying and agree 100% with it. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Absolutely. And and thank you for doing that for kids. That's awesome. Very thank admirable. you. Uh, it's it's been amazing. We we've had a, a great time. We finished the first term uh, last month, and we're starting the second term next month. And it's picking up steam. We've got some excellent partners here in Phoenix, who um, uh, different schools, public schools that we're working with. Anyway, That's it's awesome. it's it's a great yeah, it's a great little program. Um, there's something else I was going to bring up. What was it? It was uh, there was CAD Club we were talking about, and beginning with the end in mind. Well, it'll come to me. Anyway, uh, another area that uh, engineers are often called upon to help with writing is is creating proposals, right? There's a uh, customer might want a new project and we have to write a proposal for it. This might be some of the same answers, but um, what what are some tips that, that we can use to write effective proposals, you know, with, with the the goal of, of closing more deals, ideally? Focus on the client. Nobody cares that you were founded in 1827. <laughs> Nobody cares. I mean, you really have to focus on, you have to figure out what the client wants. What is the client looking for? People don't care about all that other stuff, right? So one of the biggest, th one of the biggest mistakes we see in proposals is just this litany of all the things that we've done and yeah, and we're great and good for us and all this other kind of fun stuff with no connection to how all that fun stuff relates to solving the client's problem, right? They come to you because they have a problem. How are you going to help them solve the problem, right? And so, you know, again, engineers love details, right? Great. Nothing wrong with details. But if you're going to include information, you have to you have to make sure that that information is somehow related to solving the client's problem, right? And that's that's one of the biggest things we see in 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 most proposals is just this kind of, well, I'm going to assume that they understand that because we built the Golden Gate Bridge that they understand how oh, that's going to solve their problem about trying to create a footpath through their community or whatever the case may be, right? Without making that connection, you. 
one of the things, and I, I alluded to this a little earlier, re- readers are on a journey and you're the Sherpa and it's your responsibility to guide them on the journey to the meadow or the mountain or wherever it is you're taking them. And so you have to make sure that everything works together. They have enough food and water and supplies and everything to get to the top of the mountain. And a lot of times we just simply don't do that. It's just a lot of assumptions. There's a lot of um, they'll know what things mean. They'll know the connections I'm trying to make. A lot of focus on us and what we do and very little focus on the client and the client's needs. I think you're spot on. It reminds me of a situation that we had here. Ah, situation is a strong word for this, but <laughs> I, I was copied on some emails and a customer of ours reached out and said, hey, I need some support on on this item. And one of our engineers uh, responded and, and said, okay, well, I uh, I need to remote into the system to uh, provide that support. End of email. And I'm thinking... Okay, what the customer really wants is the support. He doesn't want to know what you need to do to give him that support. He he wants the support. So let's guide him, you know, tell him exactly what the next step is. And that was the part that was missing. He says, I need to remote in to, to do that support, period, end of email. Really what it should have said is, I need to remote in to do that support. Are you free this afternoon at 3 p.m. so that I can do that, right? It's like you said, guiding the person. If, if we don't know... Uh, the, if the our recipient doesn't understand very clearly what the next step is, then we have not done our jobs communicating. Our, our engineering manager here, Michael, loves to say that the meaning of our communication is the response that we get. Absolutely. And I love we don't that. Get the, yeah. We don't get the response we want. It's it's probably because our communication was insufficient, poor I in mean, some that's, way. That, that's exactly right. If readers don't come to the correct conclusion, it's not on the reader. It's on the writer. It's the, always the writer's fault. I mean, it's poor never design. the reader. Poor, yeah, absolutely. Poor design. Yeah. And, yep, and yep. I, I get emails because sometimes people are, I'm in a hurry or whatever the case may be. But emails are probably as important, if not more important than a report or something like that because it's so immediate, right? And and it, it, it usually requires some action pretty soon or immediately. So, but people just kind of treat emails like mm, that's just like I'm just going to do it instead of thinking <laughs> about it, and planning it, like like anything else, especially with a client. Yeah, I, I'm going to go back to uh, proposals really quickly here. I'll say this in the context of proposals, but really it's true with with any kind of written communication. It's almost disrespectful when we just dump all this information in. Some of it's relevant, some of it's not. It's almost like we're requiring the recipient to sift through all of this junk and figure out, okay, what's the one paragraph that I really need to know here, right? Uh, In journalism, that's called bearing the lead, basically. How often are we bearing the lead as we uh, communicate with whoever it is we're talking to? Lately, one thing that I've been doing, because I fall victim to this myself, I'm not perfect, I, I will start writing something and I'll, I'll ask myself, what is the most important point that I want to get across in this, whether it's an email or an article I'm writing? Um, lately, I've been writing a lot of articles, so that's largely where this has been. But what is the most important thing that I want the, the reader to understand when this is done? And I'll, I'll write it down. It's usually just one or two sentences, right? Very quick. And then as I'm writing, I can I can look back at that sentence and say, okay, are the things I'm writing supporting that or are they going off in some tangent and not, not really relevant to that, uh, the, the lead, the 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 point of this whole thing. And that's been a helpful tool for me to stay on track and make sure that I'm producing content that's relevant to the message I'm I'm trying to communicate. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's what we were talking about before. Start at the start at the end. I mean, where 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 do you want your readers to go? What conclusion do you want them to draw? Yeah. Right, right. What action? Is there an action you want them to take? What is it? Okay, great. Okay. I want them to, you know, go get the garbage can or whatever the case may be. Okay, well, what do I need to do? What what do they need to be able to complete that action successfully? You know, without making people work so hard. I mean, goodness gracious, so many of the documents you pick up is just like, oh, and and, <laughs> and and what what a lot of writers don't understand is, you know, it's this idea, well, if I write it, they'll read it. Well, not necessarily, because if they've gotten 13 documents from you, which have been pretty poor, when, do- when document number 14 comes along, they don't go, can't wait to read this. They've had a lot of practice. They should be better now. No, they're making decisions because everybody's time constrained and we're bombarded with information. 
And so if, if num- they're not going to say, they're not going to give you the benefit, benefit of the doubt. I mean, readers are probably less forgiving now than they've ever been because they have so, there's so many sources, there's so much information just being thrown at them all the time. So it's really important. You're in a war for eyeballs, essentially. So it's really important that you make your documentation shine. You make it so that it, they want to read it, not that this, oh, I'm going to put this at the bottom of the pile. Yeah. And and be specific. I think that's a really important thing. Uh, another example I'll share, um, I was copying on uh, another N, another email, right? This one came from us to a customer, uh, to one of our vendors, actually. And the email said, um, how is, oh, I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, but uh, how is the machining work coming is more or less what it said. Now, really, what we cared about was when are we going to get our parts? That was the question that we really were trying to ask. But the words we used were, how is the machining work coming along, <laughs> right? So the vendor responded <laughs> and, and said, yeah, they said, oh, it's, you know, it's going fine. You know, this, th- this is what we're working on right now. And then we're going to work on that thing. And, you know, we're, we're doing our best. Thanks for checking in, I guess. <laughs> and, and so I, I was like, all right, well, let's, uh, they responded to what we, the meaning of your communication is the response that you get, right? So a, a better way to word that would have been, hey, thanks so much for what you're doing for us. We sure appreciate your help. What day do you expect to have this? all delivered to us, exactly. right? That would be the specific way to ask that question. And by the way, I'm kind of picking on a couple people on the team right now, but let me just put it out here that they are far better engineers than I am. I'm just a <laughs> so-so engineer at best on a good day. They are way more talented than I am when it comes to engineering. I happen to be, I think, fairly good at communication, so I pick some of these things out. No, that's fine. Yeah, specificity is key. It's, it, it is interesting. How, and I, I, some, we talk about this you know, in our email writing classes is that there's this tendency among for some people to just be so it's so wishy washy. And um, so they're surprised when they don't get the response they want. And then it's like, well, and then I'll say, well, what have you thought about doing it this way? And then, well, that's just rude. That's just, yeah. it's not rude. It's business. There's a big difference between me asking you for a favor would you please, you know, get the report done by Friday at five o'clock versus the report needs to be finished by Friday at five o'clock. But it's, it's this interesting kind of, I don't want to come across as rude. I don't want to, well, then you're probably not going to get what you want to get, right? It's business. Yeah. It's not, a, it's not a favor. It's just like people beginning emails with, I hope all is well. Oh, <laughs> I hate How that. How are you doing? <laughs> I, oh my God, I just hate that. And people are like, well, you're just being, you're just being nice. I'm like, you're not being nice because everybody does it. Everybody uses those words to start an email. So how are you being nice? What you're doing is you're saying, I'm just like all the other sheep. That's what you're doing. If you really want to be nice, then think about, is there some kind of personal something that you could start the email with? Whatever. It's just, it's, it's just interesting that people just, Oh, well, you're rude if you don't. No, you're not. You're not rude. I had a sales coach who called those hate emails. H A Y T stands for "How are you today?" Right? Because so <laughs> many people <laughs> they started with "How are you today?" Fine. Just... Well, my cat died this morning, and then <laughs> I got stuck in traffic, had a flat tire. Uh, I yeah. hate life right now. How are you? No like, hate emails. No, no hate emails. Well, and then the other thing to think about with emails is the expectation is that they're going to be brief and to the point. So if mm. I have something I need you to do, I'm not going to start and have a whole paragraph of fluff before I get to the ask. I respect you. You're busy. Let me get to the ask first. Right? And that's, totally. that, that shows more respect than having a paragraph full of stuff that nobody cares about. So Love it. Yeah. 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 What are some skills that we can use for for in person presentations? Where like maybe we're standing in front of a group, um, you know, it could be a presentation, but or maybe it's like a, a live thing. Maybe we're standing up in front in front of a large group doing a Q and A session or something like that. Any tips for for like live in person communication? Yeah, I think one of the things that people need to do is be themselves. I think too often when people are doing live presentations, they take on this persona that really isn't them. Um, and so, you know, thinking about being engaging, laughing, um, you know, just trying to relate, re- relate to people in a way that they, that they like you and want to, and want to speak with you. I think when you, when we are standoffish, um, and I know that, you know, 
even if you're shy, there are techniques and strategies that, that you can learn to be more engaging and compelling. Even tone of voice can change, uh, can, can help. Smiley can help, right? So a lot of us don't understand that we have a lot of these, um, a lot of these strategies, a lot of, a lot of these things that we can do, just tone of voice, smiling, being engaging, icebreakers, that kind of thing can help, um, you know, and, and being, and being human, you know, if you don't know the answer, I don't know the answer, but I'll find out for you or whatever, instead of feeling like you're, you know, you have to, you have to answer every question, even, even if you don't. And then of course, I know this never happens to anybody else, but Sometimes in presentations, you'll have people who will ask questions that aren't related. I know that's shocking. And then so being able to, you know, to handle those kinds of folks and turn that into um, a question that is related to whatever it is that you're talking about. But a lot of it is a lot of it really is practice. I'm a huge fan of Toastmasters. I don't know if you all have have Toastmasters. I'm a huge fan. They are they, they do a remarkable job. Um, and a lot of organizations bring, bring their, I don't know if it's a club or whatever it is, but into their organization, but Terrific. Yeah, just, just being human, being, being relatable. All right. Just one or two more and then we'll, we'll wrap things up here. Hopefully this next one is not sacrilegious for you, but when <laughs> should we not write and just pick up the phone and call someone or, or have an in-person conversation? Lots of times I was, um, <laughs> interviewing for a job at a university and went through the process and everything. And I was working at, at the university as an adjunct and I didn't get the job. And guess how they told me? Email. Email. Uh, well, no, that's pretty absolutely. common these days. That's pretty, that's cold. I mean, that, that it was just me, right? So it, it wasn't a mass email and, uh, you know, it was just me. I mean, and then I was right down the, off, the hall from the person who sh- should have told me. So if it's something very complicated, right, oftentimes picking up the phone is better than, than than an email. If it's something that you don't want others to particularly know about, then picking up the phone is a good uh, is a good is a good way. And it's a great way to establish rapport. I mean, especially if somebody maybe somebody's new, somebody's confused, um, you know, picking up the phone, you have to think about the medium. What's the medium? And a lot of people, you know, rely on email or default to email when email may or may not be the best way to solve the, you know, to solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I like your example there, um, of the, the individual who maybe should have walked over to your office and, and given you the news. Yeah. I will, uh, in situations where it's a delicate topic or maybe sensitive information that's being shared, I I actually like to write it out first. I'm not going to send that, but I'll write out what I want to say and the points that I want to cover. <clears throat> because as we all know, um, tone and and gesticulations and facial uh, uh, expressions get lost in in email, right? But I found it very help, helpful to write it out beforehand. So I, I, I kind of have a pretty good understanding of what I'm going to say, how I'm going to frame the conversation, and then I'll have the conversation in person. So, uh, the, you know, the tone and the emotion isn't lost in, in just words. But I also know that the words that I'm going to say, and that's been a good uh, kind of, um, uh, not a compromise, but a, a good way of utilizing both mediums, written and spoken. Well, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think sometimes when we... Um don't write things out and we just just speak that that can be uh, that can be uh disastrous is probably too too strong a word but i cer- certainly know that i that i that i've done that and when i wish i had written it down but you know they even talk about you know with emails right write the email if you're angry or whatever write it at write it but you don't have to send it you know i just yeah. let it sit yeah. and because you know let, let the brain kind of stew over yeah and see if that's if, if it's the best way to provide the information but a lot of times it's just, it's just, you know, the other thing about emails is just, there's this anonymity about it that I don't, I'm not particularly fond of when you, um, you know, you're, you're, you're emailing people with whom you may be unfamiliar or you're, or you assume people are a certain way when they're not and mm, yeah, yeah. That, that, that kind of thing. So emails can be great, but they can also be very, very tricky. So I, I like your approach. I think it's a, Mark, uh, that uh, goes back to something we, we talked about earlier on as well, where 
sometimes the act of writing it out, the most important part of that is it, it clarifies in your own head what the message actually is, right? Versus, like you said, if you just go to someone and start talking, you might not get the right message across because you haven't really thought it through. And just the act of writing it out really helps you think through what you want to say and clarify in your own mind before you start talking with someone else. Right. And it helps you get the 15 minutes of writing in a day that you should be doing. So there's there you that. Go. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Kill, perfect. You kill, you kill two birds with one stone. Uh, well, Pam, this has been delightful. I love communication. Uh, I think it's so important. I like talking about it. And uh, thank you so much for being on the oh, show thank today. Thank you and very much. It's wonderful. Joining me. Great. Well, how, how can people get in touch with you? Well, you can go to our website, which is hurleywright.com, H-U-R-L-E-Y-W-R-I-T-E.com. You can email me directly, pam at hurleywright.com. Our phone number is 877-249-7483. Or you can, obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. would love to connect with you. And um, again, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your inviting us or me. I'm, I'm, I'm the royal, it's the royal, royal we, like I said at the beginning of the, uh, the conversation, but um, thank you very much. But yeah, connect with us and I'm happy to have a chat. We have lots of resources on our website. So check us out. Awesome. Thank you, Pam. Check them out, everyone. Thank you very much, Aaron. I appreciate it. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.